From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. We're ready on your call to Boston. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yes? Mr. Semplin? Yes, but I don't believe I remember you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, we've never met. Your company hired me here in Hartford to investigate the Gene Maxwell death. Oh? It's odd that they didn't advise me. Oh, they probably will. I called you to find out the name of the officer in the charge of the case, if you could give it to me. But it's a, uh, Lieutenant DeRosa. DeRosa, huh? Do you happen to know what their theory is, if any? Theory? Well, I don't think they've arrived at a definite theory. Still a toss-up between murder and suicide, huh? Okay, Mr. Semplin, I'll be in touch. John Lund, in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Corinthian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Gene Maxwell matter. Expense account item one, 175. Phone call to Boston, advising your manager there of my assignment. Item two, $28, car rental and mileage for my Hartford apartment to police headquarters, Boston. Dollar, don't you trust us? It's not up to me to distrust you, Lieutenant. But these insurance people get uneasy when there's a choice between suicide and murder, unless the murder motive is the policy. And you don't think there's a chance of that? Well, I wouldn't say definitely not, but the Maxwell girl made her mother her beneficiary, and her mother's an invalid in a rest home. Did you know the mother had taken up with an old flame? You no, know, I didn't. Goes to see her a couple, three times a week. Crazy things have happened. I'll get the file. Now, well, this is all we've got so far, pending coroner's inquest and autopsy report. Here's a photo of where she was found. Huh. Shallow water. That's the bridge? Yeah, she was lying right about there. But I uh, don't think you have to worry about suicide, Dollar. As far as I'm concerned, it wasn't. Mm, I'll buy that, too. Wouldn't say this bridge is a suicide type. It's too low. Yeah, and there's another thing. I've been on the force for more years than I like to count. I've run into my share of suicide. Never known a woman to do it this way without taking off her coat. Oh? Usually shoes, too. I've learned that's part of a generally accepted pattern. The Maxwell girl didn't fit the pattern. And here's the way she looked. Coat on, belt still tied, shoes. Purse is missing. I'm searching the stream for it. How old was she? 21. She was a beautiful girl. I noticed that. I'm trying not to, but... Well, I couldn't help it. How much questioning have you done, Lieutenant? Not much, or rather not as much as we'll do after the inquest. When'll that be? The day after tomorrow. You want anything more here? No, well, thanks, Lieutenant. I'll check with you later. I drove out to the stream where they'd found the girl's body, and there I chalked up another point against her death being a suicide. The bridge from which she had dropped was a good four miles from town. Boston had better bridges to offer within the city limits. I followed the riverbank and found the approximate spot from which the police photograph had been snapped. On the assumption that she'd been brought there in a car, the placement of her body in relation to the two lanes on the bridge made it look as if the car was going toward Boston and not away from it. Five minutes later, I was heading the same way. Mary O'Neill? Yeah. The manager suggested I come up. He told me you shared this apartment with Jean Maxwell. That's right. Who are you? Well, my name is Dollar. I'm from her insurance company. I'd like to talk to you about her if I could. I suppose so, but there's nothing I can do now. This is the biggest shock I ever had. I always said there'd be trouble, but I never thought she'd do anything like this. Maybe she didn't. What 
that supposed to mean? Well, there are signs that say maybe she didn't commit suicide. There are? Do you think she had any reason to? That's what I said. I never thought she would. Oh, sit down. Any place. Thanks. Did you say you expected trouble? Yeah. I kept telling her. It was the way she went. Like she couldn't live fast enough. Like there wasn't enough time to get everything done. She's been like that ever since she got rid of... I mean, her mother went into that hospital. Jean was all tied down taking care of her before. What could have caused trouble? Well, I'm not saying she was wrong or anything. But there were too many men. Do you mind telling me who they are? I don't know. Only about one, Harold Corey. He's gone with her the longest. He's a big blonde truck driver. Harold Corey? He drives for the Seaboard Trucking Company. Sometimes he goes way out to the West Coast. And while he was gone, Jean didn't stay home and catch up on her reading, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think I do. Out with a different guy almost every night. I didn't cry, but she'd never tell me who they were. You think somebody killed her, don't you? Would you help me try to find out? What could I do? Well, you didn't want to pry, but I get paid to. I'd like to look at her things. I suppose it's my duty, sort of, isn't it? In a way, yeah, but I can't force you to. Oh, I know it's the thing to do. Some of her drawers are locked, but I'll show you what I can. I started on the locked dresser drawers. They gave up and opened after a brief struggle, but contained on the whole things that might normally be locked up because of their value. Imported perfumes, expensive lingerie, and some jewelry. Only thing that looked as if it might have been hidden for the sake of secrecy was... Under the jewel box, there was a gold house key with a heart-shaped bow. I never saw that before. I never saw the perfume before either, but I smelled it. That's a few hundred dollars worth of scent. And the rest of it there. Was Jean used to such expensive things? Not that I knew about. Harold Corey sure couldn't shell out that kind of money. And that heart-shaped key. (laughs) That's cozy. I'd like to keep it if I could. Oh, I don't know about that. After all, it isn't mine. I might get into trouble. Oh, you won't. I promise you. I'm working with the police on this thing. I want to find out where it was made, if I can, and who ordered it. Oh, I get it. Sure, I wouldn't stop you from doing that. Even if I could. A phone call to the Seaboard Trucking Company gave me the information that Harold Corey was out on a run to Philadelphia. It was expected about three in the morning. Expense account item three, seven dollars. Drinks and dinner after I checked into the Bristol Hotel. Item four, one dime. Phone call to Gene Maxwell's employer. Edward Hollis was at home and would see me. Come into the living room, Mr. Dollar. You may as well be comfortable. It's nice of you to see me, Mr. Hollis. I thought it would be better to do it this way rather than bother you at work. Of course, and I appreciate it. The atmosphere at the office has been gloomy enough. Oh, this is Mrs. Hollis, Mr. Dollar. How do you do? Quite well, thank you. I didn't know the poor girl, but it's a dreadful thing. Yes, I'm afraid it is. I simply don't understand. A young girl like that with everything to live for. May even be worse than that. Worse? How could it be worse? Looks more and more like her death was not a suicide. Mr. Dollar. I didn't mention it on the phone. The police think it was murder. So do I. I thought it'd be better to save the blow until I got here. Murder's pretty messy. I can't believe this. Why do they think that? Well, almost intuition, not quite. They know how people commit suicide. On an average, all suicides do certain things. The Maxwell girl didn't do any of them. This is a shock. I suppose I could be dragged into a courtroom along with everybody else who knew her. Uh, Beatrice, you run along upstairs. There's no reason for you going through this. All right, Edward. I think I'd rather. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night. I'm sorry, but it couldn't be helped. Of course it couldn't. I understand. Please don't be long, Edward. No, I won't, dear. Uh, Could I mix you a drink, Mr. Dollar? Uh, No, thanks. I'll make this as fast as possible. I don't know how much you knew about Jean Maxwell's private life. I knew nothing. I have a number of girls in the office, and it's been my philosophy to remember that not too long ago I was young, too. 
As long as they do their work well, I ask no questions. As a matter of fact, I have no right to. Sure. Uh, from what I've gathered, she was mixed up emotionally. She didn't have much freedom because of an invalid mother she took care of. Yes, I did know that. When the mother went into a hospital, Jean began to make up for lost time. She led her friends to believe that she was friendly with a lot of men. But I don't believe that. Oh? Uh-huh. I think it was one man. One with enough money to buy her expensive things, perfumes, jewelry, even a gold key. I'll have to admit that she was a beautiful thing. You say she worked with a number of girls at your office? Yes, there were 11 others. Out of those 11, did she have any close friends that you know of? Well, let's see. The, the Dyer girl, Grace, that is. They seemed to be quite friendly. I couldn't be sure of any others. Well, would you give me all their names, then? I'd like to talk to them. You know, find out if something might have come out over lunch or cocktails. Yes, of course. Perhaps it would be better if you phoned me at the office in the morning. I could give you their addresses as well. All right, we'll do it that way. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Hollis. I'm sorry meeting you couldn't have been more pleasant. The next morning, I had a list of 11 feminine names and the address of Jean Maxwell's truck driving friend. By 10.30, I was following up the ladder. later. I can't see anybody now. I'm an investigator from Gene Maxwell's insurance company. I want to talk to you about her. Wait a minute. Sorry to bother you. My name is Dollar. Come on in. I've been out of town. I didn't know about what happened until I got the paper this morning. It's really got me rocking. Yeah, I can understand that. How much do you know about it? Why'd she do it? She didn't. What do you mean by that? It's not suicide, it's murder. Murder? You knew her pretty well, didn't you? Oh, yeah, pretty well. Did you buy gifts for her? Oh, once in a while. Birthday, Christmas, times like that. What kind of gifts? What are you driving at? Can't you remember? Well, yeah. Yeah, Candy, handkerchiefs, things like that. I don't think I like your approach, mister. Now, calm down, Corey. I'm giving you a chance to rehearse before the police get at you. When did you see her last? Night before I left for Philadelphia. When was that? Two nights ago, Tuesday. I left at five Wednesday morning. She was found Wednesday morning. I know that. You're in a bad spot. Do you know that? You telling me people think I killed her? Me? I I loved her. I, I wanted to marry her. I'm sorry, friend. In this situation, that's a motive, not an alibi. Get out of here, will you? Get out and leave me alone. You're not helping yourself with this act. You're making it worse. Get out. Get out before I do have a murder to answer for. Get out! Lieutenant DeRosa. This is Dollar, Lieutenant. I just left a friend of the Maxwell girl. Name of Harold Corey. Dollar, I've been kicking myself. I'm not getting the name of your hotel yesterday. I didn't have one then. But I've got a few things to pass along to you now. Oh, that's what I meant. If I could have located you, I could have saved you the trouble. What do you mean? The death was suicide after all. What? How come? Autopsy report. There was a concussion from the drop from the bridge, but it wasn't the cause of death. Hey, wait a minute. Not so fast. The cause of death was carbon monoxide. Looks like she pulled the suicide where it embarrassed somebody and her body was tossed from the bridge to get her out of the way. We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Tomorrow night, Gangbusters brings you authentic, hard-hitting proof that crime does not pay. All the facts right out of police files. The program names names and describes actual manhunts just as they took place. It's a Saturday evening event for adventure fans right here on CBS Radio. Don't miss Gangbusters. Tomorrow night, over most of these same CBS radio stations. Gangbusters. (laughs) Gangbusters. 
Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This, uh, new theory of yours. What's the matter? Don't you like it? Well, I thought I was making progress in the other direction. Give it to me again, will you? Yeah. Here's the autopsy report. Uh, death by asphyxia caused by presence of large amounts of carbon monoxide. Agent unknown. That's it. Probably automobile exhaust. That's the most popular these days. Hmm. You believe this, Lieutenant? I believe what's in the report. And how did you say she got into the river? Oh, I said maybe she committed suicide somewhere so that somebody would get involved. We'd get rid of her. She was probably dumped in the stream. What's the matter, Dollar? I thought you'd be happy with the suicide evidence. The insurance company hired me to dig up the facts. If it was suicide, all right. But if it wasn't, they want to know that, too. And I still don't think it was. Why not? From what I've learned, she wasn't the type. She liked to be alive. And she played it hard enough to leave some motives lying around. Jealousy, for one. That boyfriend of hers, Corey? He's a possibility. I talked to him, and for my money, he deserves checking. And then there's this. Hmm. What does this unlock? I wish I could tell you. It was undoubtedly given to her by somebody. I'd like to know who. You think you could put a couple of men on it to find out where it was made? All right, darling. I'll stick my neck out that far for you. I'm under orders, you know. I'll have to be assigned before I can investigate. Sure, sure. I understand. Well, I'll take your story upstairs and see what the brass says. Let me know what else you find, huh? Yeah, I will. Oh, you have the address of the old flame you mentioned? The mother's friend? <laughs> Still like to settle for fraud, wouldn't you? Now, the death sergeant will give it to you. His name's Paul Anderson. <laughs> I'm from Gene Maxwell's insurance company, Mr. Anderson. Wonder if you could spare me a few minutes. Uh, yes, I suppose so. Come in. You're the adjuster? So soon? I'm an investigator. Oh? I didn't know she had a policy. Yeah, she did. $25,000 to go to her mother. I see. But her death has been classed as suicide, which voids the policy. The two-year self-destruction clause is still in effect. Uh, that's a pity. Why do you say that? It's the least she could have done for poor Mildred. That's her mother? Yes. An extremely young mother. who has almost ruined her life for that girl. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, the daughter was born when Mildred was only 17. And she was left to care for the child herself. I helped as much as I could. Oh, I don't want you to misunderstand. There's nothing to be hidden. I suppose it is unusual. I did meet Jean first. But when she took me to her home and I met her mother, uh, I realized that Jean was no more than a cheap little opportunist. The complete opposite from her mother. As I say, I suppose it is unusual. Yeah, but that doesn't make any difference. The point is that you dropped the girl in favor of her mother. Is that it? It wasn't the gross situation you evidently wish it had been. Now, look here. This has gone far enough. You've asked me these questions for one reason. So that you can draw your own conclusions. Haven't you? I didn't know it showed. Well, it does. You think I sent Mildred to the home to get her out of the way, don't you? Well, that's not the case. But you can think what you like. Go ask Mildred if you care to. I won't bother. Do you know anything about a gold key that Jean had? A gold key? No, I don't know anything about a gold key. I've known very little about Jean at all these past months. Yeah. So many people seem to know so little about her. <laughs> Dollar, I've been wondering how you were making out. How are you, Mary? Have the police been here yet? No. I'll be scared to death if they do come. I feel guilty the minute one looks at me. Hmm. That's common enough. Have you uh, remembered anything that might help? No, not a thing, Mr. Dollar. I hardly slept last night. It's creepy. 
with her room just like it was the last time she left it. I've got to either move or get somebody else in there. Yeah. Now, Mary, did Jean ever mention a Paul Anderson to you? Anderson? No, I don't think so. Not that I can remember, anyway. She was always kind of secret about things. She did talk to you about her mother, though. A little, yeah, about her being in the hospital. Anything about how she got there? No, except I got the idea Jeannie thought it was wrong, how much fun she was having without her mother to worry about. She never told you who was paying the bills? No, who was? This Anderson guy? Yeah. You sure she never mentioned him? I'm sure I'd remember if she did, because I was curious, and she never mentioned any of them. Okay. Thanks, Mary. It was 4 p.m. then, and at 5, I was standing in front of the Seaboard Trucking Company building on Columbus Avenue as Harold Corey backed a big rig into a parking area and headed for a short-order restaurant across the street. Hello, Corey. And what this time? The dispatcher tells me you're going out on another run. Pretty short layover, isn't it? Yeah. You decided to look into the way I do my work? Oh, I just wondered if there was a reason for this quick run. Yeah, there is. I asked for it. I figured driving I could get my mind off this thing. Anything wrong with that? Well, maybe not. You know how she died? I read about it. Carbon monoxide. Yeah. The police have decided that doesn't sound much like murder. What do you think? She's dead. That's as far as I can think. You knew about Paul Anderson, didn't you? Well, what about Paul? Well, that he might have been more interested in Jean than he was in her mother. I suppose you're just doing a job, aren't you? Well, if what you say is true, I didn't know about it. If I had known about it, I would have killed him, not Jean. Now, leave me alone, mister. I can't take any more. Well, I don't enjoy it either. As you say, I'm just doing a job. <laughs> I checked that night with six of the 11 girls who had worked, lunched, and chatted with Jean Maxwell. Their collective description was of a girl who listened to and enjoyed what other people said, but had little to offer herself. None of them knew anything about her private life. But the next morning, the police located a goldsmith who said he remembered making the heart-shaped key. I went out to see him, then got back to Lieutenant DeRosa. How'd you make out with that fussy little man, darling? Well, we found the day the key was ordered, and he remembered a few things, because a councilman's wife came in the same day. What? The customer, J. E. Carter was the name he gave, mentioned a cottage on the bay. That's east. The girl's body was found northwest of here. I think she was dumped from a car coming toward Boston from out there. So, I think the cottage is in that direction. <laughs> it's deduction yet. Well, if I were going to dump a body, I wouldn't carry it through town to take it to that bridge, would you? I'm being paid to think about another case. I couldn't sell the murder pitch upstairs, but I tried, and I'll buck for promotion if you're right and upstairs is wrong. I don't suppose you could earn that promotion by assigning some men to cover that northwestern section, could you? Oh, mm, not a chance. That's county. Division of responsibility. Yeah. And we'd all be surprised to know how many criminals take advantage of that. Expense account item four, $35, mileage, covering a two-and-a-half-day canvas of real estate offices northwest of town. Object, a cottage probably rented previous to the month of June by a man possibly using the name J.E. Carter. It was a vague lead that meant morning to night legwork, but on the third afternoon, it paid off. Yeah, we don't rent much up here, that's why I remember. Uh, she was a dark-haired girl, is that right? That's right. Yeah, it's the Anson place out on uh, Butch Road. Has anybody been there in the past few days? Yeah, not that I know about. It used to be there every two, three days, too. How was the rent paid? Cash or check? By, uh, uh oh, cashier's check. Well, was it regular? Definite day of the month, I mean? And do you know the bank? Yeah, between the first and fifth of each month since me. Uh, check on the commercial bank. Oh, thanks. Now I'd like to ask one more favor. Would you take me out of the cottage? I certainly will. If it's a police fair, I'm not the one to stand in the way. Well, Mr. 
Carla, I've always said that I personally vouch for the people I do business with. But uh, you never know, do you? Mm, that's a profound truth in any business. I'll certainly try to be more careful in the future. Uh, do you want to go now? Yeah, I think I've seen enough. Uh, let me lock it. I want to see if this key fits. Mm, it's it. Yeah, it did. Well, I didn't expect to see you again. Didn't you, Mr. Hollis? You thought you'd get away with it? What did you say? Well, there's no reason to be clever with each other. I know you killed her. You rented a cottage out beyond Mystic River. You used the name J.E. Carter. Come into the other room. Yes, you're right. I did become infatuated with her. If you'd known her, you'd understand. I realized last week that it had to stop, and I told her. She'd been with that young Corey boy. I told her that even if I were single and eligible to marry her, I would advise her to hang on to him. Someone her own age. That was last Tuesday night. Yes. She left the cottage and I heard her drive off. Or at least I thought I did. When I went out, I learned what she'd really done. She'd committed suicide in the car. You can hardly blame me for wanting to keep the secret. It wasn't suicide, Mr. Hollis. You know it, and I know it. All right, Mr. Dollar. I'll make my statement to the police. Fine. I'll drive you down. Thank you. Edward. Beatrice, go back upstairs. No, Edward, I won't. I insist, Beatrice. What good would it do? After what I've done, because I lost you, why should you ask me to go upstairs while I lose you again? I forbid you to say another word. Mr. Dollar. She had taken him away from me. Because she was beautiful. And I no longer am. I was waiting in their cottage. When they came in, I struck her. Is this true, Mrs. Hollis? Yes. I killed her. And since there was nothing left of our lives, we carried her to the garden. It was... What have I done? What have I done? Expense account item five, $110, final bill for car rental. Item six, $85, miscellaneous. Expense account total, $266.85. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. John Lund can currently be seen in the Universal International picture just across the street. Featured in tonight's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Howard McNear, Ted DeCorsia, Virginia Gregg, John McIntyre, Barney Phillips, and Dick Ryan. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Dovalle. <laughs> This is Dan Coverley, inviting you to join us next week at the same time when John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And remember, Tarzan brings you his adventures Saturday evenings on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>